Hello. Hello, Mike. Hi. Uh, Ron, it's good to see you. We are just um, opening our show, the first UK show of Esther Perez Arad, um, an Israeli artist, and her son, uh, Ron Arad, is with me today in conversation. Now, we are live. And if the, I mean, we really are live, we're talking to each other now in real time. And if the technology allows and any of you have got any questions, then um, you can uh, ring them in and we will uh, endeavor to answer them as we go. So Ron, it's good to see you. Excellent to see you. It's been a long time. It, it has, yes. Yes, I think I think a couple of years. Right, it's amazing how we met, which is a a funny story. But the reason we are here now, yes, is thanks to that. Yes, can I tell you before you talk about that? Can I tell you about something else which I really only thought about today, and. When I was thinking about chatting with you um, and just looking through a few notes that I have, I noticed that your father left Vienna in 38, 1938, yeah. 1938 to go to Israel. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how big the Jewish community was in Vienna at that time. It couldn't have been huge because it was a fairly a fairly um, small town, although important place. But my parents were in Vienna at exactly that time. Um, didn't actually leave till thirty nine, but it just occurred to me that they may well have known each other. I mean, I can never I can never tell. But so they did. Who knows? He came to he came to uh, Israel when he was about seventeen. Yeah, he went via Trieste. Yes, see, being because Vienna doesn't have any, and he also some of his neighbors gave him two boxer dogs to take to Israel, and he when he came he arrived in his leather hoisen, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, Many stories about wanting to go on the bus, and the bus said, "No, you can't take the dogs." So he said to him, oh, "Do you want me to release them now in the bus?" <laughs> anyway, and he joined, he joined the kibbutz, and he start. No, he joined. He, they started, and after I don't know how many years, he left because the kibbutz uh, meeting, members meeting, allowed him only one day a week. To do sculpture, and he wanted to, so he decided to leave. And then he moved to Tel Aviv, and he met Esther in an art school, and he was a very cultured. He knew Goethe and Schiller and, and Shakespeare all by heart, and he was the cultured boy, and, and a very talented uh, sculptor as well. When my mother got together with him, everyone warned her that you know you, you'll be with him, you'll always be in his shadows. The opposite happened somehow. I mean, she sort of, and he stayed very, very you know, very loyal to her art and things. In the end of the life, when he became a photographer, he, in, he, they did uh, work together. They call it paintographs, where he did photographs that he discovered computers at a very late age. Well, first he did it with negatives that, um, but anyway, work. And the funny thing that is the touching thing is he went on doing work collaboration with Esther after she passed away. Because wow. he, he, he outlived her by some ten years, I think, and uh, he went on working with her on a daily basis. Amazing, yeah. amazing work. I'll show you one day. Yes. Yeah. So. Will you, do you want to tell the story of how we met? Because yeah. it started with you. Yeah, first of all, when in, 
the last years of my mother, the biggest problem she had, the thing that bothered, what is going to happen to all my work? What is going, that, that's the biggest problem in the world for her. And after that, you know, after when she passed away, my father looked after it uh, at home. And then we, when he passed away, this problem sort of moved to us. You know, we did, what exactly are we doing? Are we, we, we had, because I was here in London and that was there. And it was like, uh, it's something that, you know, uh, was something I had to do something with. And one Sunday we went for lunch in Belsize village where we live. And there was a funny little gallery there called uh, Sylvester Gallery. And it was very curious because they had all sorts of very good work there, like Nichols, Peg Nicholson and, and uh, Pike, I don't know, all sorts of big sort of names in, in British art and sometimes Miro and sometimes Chagall. And, and it sort of did make sense to have that gallery next to the Gringosa in uh, Belsize village. And I thought, mm, maybe, maybe I can put some of, of my mother's work there. So I talked to Andrea and I said, look, I'll take some catalogs and I'll, I'll show you. And I said, okay. So after that, I went home and I said, I'll do it now. Unlike me, I normally delay things, but I said, I'll do it now. I took some catalogs and went back to the gallery and said, look, here it is. She looked at it and said, oh, great, but I think it's not me you should talk to. You should talk to Mike Goldmark. Uh, he's, he's the right person to, I said, okay, I'll show it to him. Then I remember lending in, uh, coming back from abroad in Heathrow, the phone ring, and it's Mike Goldmark. He says to me, I'd like to represent your mother. I said, really? <laughs> And then I said, I said, do you need to see more? Is there more you No, I've seen enough. And then I said, don't you, do you think it makes sense to take the work from a place where she's pretty well known to a place where no one's heard her name? And Mike said, mm, the only thing that matters is the quality of the work. Nothing else matters. I said, well, that's amazing. And here we are now. After that, we talked, we met, we met each other in, in London. And, uh, and we packed and shipped everything and sent it to Uppingham. I've never heard of Uppingham before, but uh, we had a really nice visit. And I recommend it to everyone who's listening because it's an amazing place, amazing gallery. I don't know if it's still there, but if you come on Sunday or, or the weekend, there's, there's a free lunch to all the visitors. Is it still there? It's still there. Yeah, we still, well, not, right now. The, not now, but the moment we reopen properly, it's there seven days a week. Yes. Seven days a week. Oh, seven right. days a week, there's a free lunch. I thought there's no such a thing as a free lunch. But, well, quite. <laughs> but we, 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 share, we share our, we make more than we can eat every day because there are quite a lot of us working here. So we have to feed them. And uh, we, we make lots of food. And then if someone is walking through the gallery, we invite them to join us. So, yeah, I mean, I remember we sat at the roundhouse in London and he told me uh, that because, I don't know, there's, you don't pay London rents, that means you can have a page at the back, the back page of the Royal Academy magazine every time and so I remember running back to the studio after that the first thing I did I ran to the pile of the RA magazine and turned all the magazines to see yes uh, Goldmark Picasso the, da, 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 da. anyway so um, all the rest is now uh, it's not history or making history I mean the event yesterday was very very moving and very exciting it's the first time I could look at my mother's work as an outsider. Because uh, I heard Max talking about it and Richard Cook. And 
and uh, I saw it differently from the as an outsider, as a visitor, as I was watching a TV program about someone, that, and it was uh, very, very moving uh, to me and and my family, my brother in America, and my and it was really good. Thank you. We got we got a beautiful email from your brother afterwards from uh, Atar. Really, yeah. really lovely email. Right, good. So uh, that, that was very pleasant that we could do that too. And the, and the show in the gallery looks absolutely wonderful. And what what is extraordinary is that um, just at the moment, um, this very first show uh, for us, which we thought originally might be something of a taster show, um, is proving to be hugely successful. I mean, we, we've hardly started, made a nice catalogue, as you know, but I don't know whether the camera can pick this up, but um, there we are, red dots already. I think we've, I think we've wow. sold something like 30 works already. Amazing, amazing. Uh, I don't know if you know gallery, in, no London gallery sells anything now. It's like, it's difficult. Amazing. Are they doing, something, doing something amazing. And it's uh, nice to not what you expected to do. Yes. Amazing. But I, I think, very, I think, Ron, very often that um, when times are, are difficult, things are difficult, um, usually it's that yin and yang, usually there is a way. And often you look through 180 degrees and you do precisely what no one would expect. And very often that works. I, I rather suspect you work that way. Um, Occasionally. Probably, yeah. Yeah. But uh, certainly, we printed, we made a lovely catalogue and that looks great. Um, and sent out. I think, I think fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred catalogues have gone out, and we're selling the work, and people are loving it. Excellent. Um, so, what, tell, will you will you tell me a little bit about what it was like when you were? A little boy with your mother did she did she pay you huge amounts of attention or was she busy painting or uh you, yeah i mean huge amount of motherly attention yeah and she was painting she was painting at home the studio was in the middle of it later i sort of designed the studio for her in the in the garden in the garden but yeah she worked at home and uh, and more than that, she was the art teacher in my elementary school. Oh. She was my art teacher. Right. I remember once standing next to her with my, my uh, drawing or painting while she was talking about it. And I, and I see the whole class is laughing, laughing. I noticed that I had my arms around, <laughs> around I did it, the natural thing, I had my arms around her shoulder. And I forgot that she's my teacher, not my mother. <laughs> it's very strange. But yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I blame her for everything I do. Because when I, every time I did a sketch or a drawing, she never, she, she always used to say, ah, great, that's fantastic. You'll be a great architect. <laughs> and. Because she thought, she probably thought that architects are more a safer profession than a peace artist. <laughs> so uh, she never said, oh, you'll be a great painter. She, or, or maybe it wasn't good enough. I don't know. No, but it is like she, uh, and I, I, I didn't plan to study architecture. I didn't. Uh, when I came to, to London, I just looked at art schools and I looked at the Architectural Association, the AA, 
that the, those days, because no one was building anything in, in England or in London, it looked more like an art school than the Slade or the Royal College because uh, people talked about conceptual architecture and, uh, and the final product was a piece of paper, not bricks and mortar. So I saw the, I went to the, to the AA for an interview. I improvised the interview. And can we see your portfolio? No, I don't have a portfolio, but I have my, uh, my 6B pencil. Shall I draw something for you? <laughs> I was a cocky bastard. <laughs> And then, they, why do you want to be an architect? I don't want to be an architect. My mother wants me to be an architect. <laughs> anyway, and they gave me a place for some reason. Maybe someone likes some of this. Anyway, so I I uh, I blame her for studying architecture. I enjoy studying architecture, but I always found ways of of doing things outside what I'm really expected to do. Maybe oh. the, how, old, how old were you when you left Israel? I was 21, 20, 21. And may I ask you why you left? I, I never left. I, I was a tourist here and I sort of stayed. I never picked my LPs and my things, said, okay, I'm leaving. No, I just, I stayed, I had, I had a different, I had, my view and my my imagined London came from film, like I don't know, like Morgan, the suitable case for treatment by David. Things like you know, like yes. every film that we saw that was from England looked like culture to us, as opposed to junk from America. It's not true, of course, but that's as teenagers, that's what we made ourselves believe and of course i didn't find the england the london i imagined sure you know in london some of it and and your your older brother went to america no no he went to he went before mary before america he went to uh, to belgium to study it was like the greatest violin he was still a violinist before he right. moved to Europe. And he went to Brussels and he studied in Brussels. And he moved to America when he joined the Cleveland Quartet later on. But uh, yeah. So he was, you know, my parents. They made a big uh, thing about him being a musician and I'm being a visual. So you don't, so there's no conflict. So it's like, I remember once when I wanted to, to, to learn the violin, I was told any instrument but the violin, you don't want to spend your life being almost as good as your brother. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so now I find myself uh, destroying violins. I don't know if there's any, <laughs> not, destroying, not destroying, I'm doing, maybe if you have time, maybe not, I, I'm working on quartets and violins. Sure. They themselves. But uh, I can show it to you now, later, whatever. Was your was your mother sad that you both moved away? Uh, yes, of course. But we, she never made us feel guilty. She never. They. She thought good. She thought it's they. They were. They were supporting both of us in our decisions. And um, yeah, of course. I mean, they used to come come here to visit us, um, their visits, it's, uh, it's amazing. She had to see all the galleries, even of, you know, even of the art she didn't like, she had to see everything. The first place my brother, my father, my father used to go in the come here would be to Rowney's right. to, to stock up for, for drawing materials. And, uh, then we used to, of course, my parents, I have to go to the country. And it was a big thing choosing what bed and breakfast because the views are, let's stay here because uh, she was always, 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 everything was 
sort of everywhere she looked at was she was making she was looking at it as a subject matter i don't know so the the um I, it's it's been strange because while we've been working uh, on your mother's art i sort of got to know her by by looking at the at the work and the the energy which she had was extraordinary and it was and the courage and a feeling that she didn't actually care what anyone thought. She was just going to do what she was going to do. True. Just amazing. Yeah. And, and she never, she never stopped. And, and when, in a, when she was, it was difficult for her to go out and move. Uh, she had a very big window to life, which was the television. Yes. Every day she watched television, but she drew. So if you if you looked at the sketchbook in the morning, you could see it was like TV Times. You could see what was on television last night and who was on television. Because she was she didn't stop. Um, yeah. And um, but all of that sort of um, in in good spirit. There was no like. Uh, I don't know what to say. It was all um, with joy. Sure. And and not to want to flatter you, but you, you are known all over the world for what you do. And your brother is known all over the world for what he does. And that's that's an extraordinary... Um, to, to have two sons who in different fields. Um, Maybe it's because the technique of divide and rule. You go to me, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, and I, I had to be, I mean, like, uh, I was, I was the, the little one and I had to look at, I, I don't know, I had to invent my way of doing things. So, you know, like getting, applauded for not doing what I thought I was expected to do. So that's what I'm still doing. Um, yeah, they were very, you know, good, very supportive. Uh, maybe more supportive of me than I was of them. I don't know, like, uh, when I was, uh, there were lots of discussion about me representing the avant-garde and she is still of the Paris who, I mean, I don't know, it was, um, yeah, I mean, the only complaint I have against my parents is that I don't have a lot to complain about. I was very jealous of lots of my friends that had, that enjoyed rebelling against the parents, and I, I was deprived of that. <laughs> What's a... Did, did you find it easy when you came, were you accepted when you came over here? Uh, was I, yeah, I mean, uh, look, a lot of, you ask a lot of the time, uh, you, you ask a lot of the time, like, uh, about the influence of where you come from on your work, where you're from. I think, no, it's more the influence of being an outsider being not from here. Yes. More different. That makes as a bigger influence than where you're from. And also I believe that people that come from the periphery uh, respond more intensely to what happens in the center. I mean we couldn't wait for a new, every new issue of art form and we used to read it cover to cover and we knew everything about what's happening in New York in New York arts, even anyone that, any art student in New York, because we were in the periphery. It happens to me that sometimes I go to, I don't know, to Prague and I find people that know more about what I do than I do. <laughs> because it, it, it uh, anyway. So what was the question? <laughs> I, I was wondering how, how, whether you felt accepted here. I mean, one of the things, it's in, interesting because you saying that because um, I was born over here, but of um, European parents, Austrian parents. And 
I strangely still don't feel at home, a sort of rootlessness. And I wonder whether you have that. Is this home to you or is home still in Israel or do you feel that you don't really have a home in that way? Oh, my home is very much here. And I, again, I don't have, yes, I'm not, I'm an outsider, but I sort of enjoy being an outsider. Yes. It didn't uh, disturb anyone to to invite me to be a professor at the Royal College of Art or to make me a Royal Academician. Or th- but it does, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, there is, look, people that go to America speak American after a while. When, yeah. you, come, when you come to London or you come to England, you don't speak English. I mean, I, I, I'll i always be, I'll open my mouth and I'm a foreigner. I think it would be different if I went to America instead. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But uh, also, what, what do you become? I mean, like, you come to London, you become what? An Etonian, a Cockney, uh, uh, a Geordie. Uh, I, you don't, you know, the, the, there's not, there, it's, it's you can't choose what sort of Londoner you're going to go to be. So you're a, you're a Londoner. You you are you know. But it's true that I don't know when I my old my example when I hear strawberry fields forever it doesn't make me think about Liverpool. It makes me think of Tel Aviv. Sure. Because that's what you know, like like art form magazine. It's the same. Yeah. Someone's just um, passed me a question. I don't know. That someone's just phoned in, uh, and they say, "What are you working on now? Um, furniture or architecture?" In the last in the last uh, two weeks, we worked really hard on uh, doing a project to raise money for the health service, and I came up with the idea to do. Uh, face covers, masks with art on them. So this would be a Picasso and that's wonderful. And then it's we're going to launch it any any what do you want the Matisse? There's Matisse. Now uh, tomorrow is is Florence Nightingale's 200th birthday. And so I, I spent yesterday doing the, the tali. Uh-huh. And, and uh, I drew Shakespeare for his birthday. Anyway, so it's, you will hear, I hope, hopefully, it's a very complicated thing because it's to do with lots of little issues that have to be sorted, not by me, but by the charity that... Uh, uh, we're working for. I worked on. I worked on three things, three exhibitions this year, uh-huh. and uh, they all, unlike uh, Goldmark Gallery in Uppingham, they all postponed or cancelled. So I can. One of them it was going to be now a show in LA in, in a gallery that's called Over the Influence and it's called Don't Fuck With the Mouse <laughs> because it's something to do with Mickey Mouse's 90th birthday and and when you with Disney when you do actually it started by being asked by the Disney Corporation to do something but when you work for Disney, they don't pay you, you pay them to work for them. Is but that true? Is that true? Of course. I mean, the, they put me in touch with a French company that paid them money to use the right to say Mickey Mouse or Disney. They introduced us, but I, and I did it first as a product, but then the comp- that company had some problems. Uh, of their own, they went past or something. So I said, okay, I'll take it from a product. I'll make I'll make it as a as a piece of art. I'll make 
a limited edition rather than an endless. Uh, I can show you. Shall I share the screen? Oh, please. Yeah. Um, can you see my screen now? I can. Can yeah. you? Okay. Yeah. So first, I'll, I'll start again complaining against my mother because I do these things. Uh, the, the edition every every Friday I go to that studio and I do things like that. Anyway, the name I called my lawyer and said I know I can't call it Mickey Mouse, but can I call it Topolino, which is Mickey Mouse in Italian? And he said to me, strictly speaking, you can, but in my profession, there's a sentence: don't fuck with a mouse. So I said. Thank you, James. This is a, this is a better, much better name. So the series is called Don't Fuck With The Mouse. Oh, sorry, we're not allowed to say this word. W, blah, blah, blah. The, the. Anyway, so when I go, when I do this on Fridays, I think, why don't I do it all the time? Why do I bother with other stuff? Because it's so much more fun. And the thing about this one is that you only see what you did uh, when you, you take it off the mold. Uh, so I'll just run quickly. Um, do you see it okay? Yes. You see it like I do? Yeah, they're beautiful. Fantastic. And so every Thursday, there's the mouse. Yeah. Every Thursday, I have to think of an idea for for the next for the next week. So for the for for the Friday morning. So hang on, let me let me not. I don't want. So there's this one that says I'm all ears, <laughs> and what the confession is that. Uh, Every time I look at what I did, because you don't see it, you, you do one layer and then you do another layer above it, and you cover the first. You only see it for the first time when it's outside the mold. Yes. And mostly you get much better than what you deserve. Um, so let me show you. I mean, like, I don't. So I mean, like, so far so good. Uh, it has, and I don't know if you know the the, the brand Supreme, which is uh, they did a whole brand cop uh, based on taking the the typeface of Barbara Kruger, and anyway, so that's. But what? One of the last ones I did was uh, called What Now? I did this on the 31st of January, which was the Friday that we were supposed to leave the EU. And we thought that date is the end of the world. We thought, ooh, we are on the, looking at the cliff now and, and, the world's not going to be the same. Today, no one, people hardly remember Brexit. Sure. But that day, I I went, I stopped on the way to the studio and I bought all the newspapers of the day, including the sun. The first time in my life I bought the sun. <laughs> and uh, it was all people are shouting Brexit, like more, you know, Morning Brexit or celebrating it, and I took I took all the papers and started. You see what what I glue here in the front it is actually the bed because everything is upside down when you work on a mold. And on top of that, that in the in the polyester, the newspaper becomes transparent, so you don't have just the piece you choose. You also get. You get uh, you get the um, the other side, and again, there's a lot of a lot of 
amazing good luck there. That's extraordinary. Uh, and it is, and I thought this is this is the you know wow, I, I froze the day, the most important day in, in in our recent history. How wrong was I? Because so yeah. So, so what, Ron? How, how many different ones are there in the in the edition? Twenty. 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 Here, I'm also teasing, teasing this the withdrawing the silhouette of of Mickey. Yes. Yeah. If the if the chair itself is not enough. Anyway, so this is this is a uh, that, that's that's something that. Now they're talking maybe we'll do the show in, in August. Another project that was going to open in a gallery in Tel Aviv is, is this one, uh, the quartet. Nice. I wonder if, if my mother saw this sketch of mine, and she said, ooh, it's going to be a good plumber. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the idea here was to do to put something, I'll call it vibrator, but it's called actuator. It has all sorts of names. Something that vibrates, instead of the strings vibrating, it's uh, something that's connected to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth uh, that makes a Stradivarius sounds like a Stradivarius, and Amati sounds like an Amati. Uh, and uh, so this is like an early, early sort of uh, simulation of, I wanted to do a quartet that you walk around the instruments and you can hear. Uh, and I work with uh, uh, Peter Greiner, who's one of the leading contemporary violin makers. And when I told him, of course, we come from visual art, so we don't expect the sound to be as, he said, it will. So he helped us a lot. Um, let me see. Uh, this is the friends of my, my brother, an American quartet, uh, Pacifica. They recorded for us each instrument separately. It was very difficult for them they, until they found four rooms where they can see each other in the studio because they needed eye contact. And that's my brother. And that's. So, uh, by the way, the, the BBC wanted to follow a project. From the beginning, a project I don't know how I don't know how it ends. So there's a program you can see it. It's called In the Studio, BBC World Service, and and you can also hear the sounds. So let me see. I mean, tell me if you hear anything. Yeah, can you hear it? You can hear it. So this is the first, the first attempt. Uh, of course, in the real one, there's no more, we don't see anything, any wire, it's all, it's all uh, Wi-Fi-ish, and, and all the actuators are inside the instrument, so you don't see anything. This is Haydn being played, but the main piece of this is a quartet. And this called Wings, which I might This is Peter, this is Peter too. These are all his vibes. Of, of research, I think, but let me show you. Um, then I started playing with the instruments themselves, like this one is called So Far So Good. I copied the calligraphy of the Fs and things. And again, uh, the violin maker helped me do it. Uh, this one, I think. Arman might be very, Arman would be very upset with this one, but it sounds amazing. It is, uh, it, it has all the electronics hidden in it. And this is only half a violin, uh, 
bonded to a reflective surface. So you can see it looks as if the violin is floating in space. And oops, so far so good. Oops. And all sorts of different takes on instruments. This one is dedicated to Pablo Casals. Uh, and I carved a sentence that's attributed to him, if she dies, she dies. It's, I'll tell you the story, tell you why. It's because when he was 80, he married a girl of 20 and his doctor told him, you know, Pablo, some activity can be lethal <laughs> at a certain age. And he said, look, if she dies, she dies. <laughs> Anyway, this is what this is at the roundhouse. This is the, the quartet as it looks now. There's no point in making you hearing it now because the whole point is going between the instruments and not not hearing it like. So that's that. If I switch the camera now, if I hang on. Actually no, I'll I'll stay, I won't stop. Hang on. Can you still see me? Yes. Uh, in the summer show, I was going to install something these days, and it was uh, a Morgan car. You know, the, the classic English car. At least an outsider thinks it's a classic English car. Uh, and the idea was to, to weave a flattened sketch like that. Right. And, and this is like what was going to happen. <laughs> and, and, okay, so um, this is like a simulation of how it would look at the Royal Academy. You'll notice that the grill of the car has RA, which is like the grill on the floor of the which I don't know if it's for Ron Arad or for the Royal Academy, but I'll show you something. You'll be the first people to see here. Go on uh, then. I will just get out, I'll stop broadcasting. Okay. Am I back? You're back you now, me? yes. yes. And I will get, hang on, why can't I see? Okay. And I'll get rid of the virtual background. I'll get rid of it. So it's none. Okay. I'll, I'll show you, this is where I, I'll show you something that I have on my desk here, which is, a joint work of my father and and there's my mother in old age, of course, drawing. Um, anyway, so I'll switch the camera, and here I build this in my in my bedroom. <laughs> uh, it is okay. There's no modern car inside. I made it out of of pillows and cushions and chairs and whatnot to make it look a bit like like a car so oops ah sorry so it is it's woven it's pretty amazing the weaving oh, look at that and uh i'll go outside and this is this is sort of um, like like a child playing with bricks. I, I made this with cushions and pillows and chairs and and whatnot. And uh, and this is the lockdown for you. You still obviously enjoy the making process, actually getting uh, your hands on things. Oh, this is this is uh, an Esther's work when she was a teenager. Wow. I have it here, and what does anyway? I um, oops, 
hang on. And I'll go back to Yeah, I'm back. Is there, Ron, is there a particular time when you have the ideas? Ideas are not a problem. The problem is to know which ideas. Thank you. Let me close the door here. The problem is to know which ideas you you invest in, which I give ideas you give time to. Yes. Ideas ideas are, are not a problem at all, but uh, you can get an idea. I, if, I tell, if I tell you that the, the masks, the idea of the mask came from working on the Morgan, does it make sense? No, it doesn't. But I thought, oh, maybe I'll, because here I covered a car with a drawing of the car and I thought we'll cover a face with a face. So it comes, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to make sense. The only thing is, is do I do it or do I not? And for that, there's a very easy formula. Uh -huh. What's if, that? If the formula is, if I went to a gallery and I saw, I saw a Morgan covered with a woven thing, would I be jealous? Yes, okay, I'll do it. Would I, <laughs> would I not be jealous now? Let's not bother with it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a wonderful way of making decisions. Absolutely. It's been fantastic talking with you. It was nice. Really, really, really enjoyed it and lovely to see the, the things that you're doing. And I, I hope the masks are a great success for you. Well, me too, me too, because it, 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 it will be. Yes. Um, we, will, we will keep in touch as we uh, and, and show you more and more of uh, how we're getting on with selling your mother's work. Showing it, yeah. Good. Let's hope, let's hope that, uh, that in next week's briefing, Boris Johnson will say to everyone, go to art galleries. We'll keep, our fingers, we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. Okay. Ron, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Speak soon. Good. Thank you, everyone. Well, I'm absolutely delighted that she's been given her first ever show in this country because, like so many women artists of the past, she's been overlooked internationally. And it's high time that this extraordinary body of work that she created over a very long and prolific uh, career is actually brought to our attention so that we can not only look at it and enjoy it, uh, but also deeper than that, I think, we can learn from it. Welcome to our Esther Peretz Arad exhibition opening. The first time her work has really been shown in the UK. As you walk through that front door, there's a tremendous feeling of light and, and colour and, and sort of joyousness in, in these paintings. We're going to be having a look at some of them uh, in detail, uh, have a look at the, um, the places where Esther Peretz Arad worked, uh, the influences that, that have uh, informed her, her painting over the years. and. Uh, hopefully give you a sort of flavour of the, the, where these beautiful paintings have come from. I hope you enjoy today. Peretz Arad was born in Bulgaria in 1921. And she was just three years old when her parents, a uh, Jewish family, uh, emigrated to Tel Aviv. She grew up in a time of, of intense sort of chaos, disruption and social unrest. And you can sort of feel that mixture of, uh, of social, cultural melange going on in the, in the paintings of this time. 
Uh, it's a street scene from 1970. Beautiful range of colour and brush techniques, but what I love is this sort of this sense of the different uh, different classes, different uh, backgrounds of the people shown here. You've got these lovely sort of rather sort of aristocratic looking ladies in their long coats and, and hats. Yes. And then this figure who almost disappears right at the edge of the canvas. Which ones were you looking at? Watching as these people walk by. And then if you come over here and have a look at some of these portraits. This top one, almost like a sort of Rembrandt painting. These beautiful darks and lights across the, across the piece. These portraits of men just can feel something of that, that sort of tension, a place of what, what must have been an extraordinarily exciting, yeah. at times frightening place to have grown up and to have worked. And a place where a sense of, uh, of identity, of, of cultural national identity, which was already strongly felt before uh, the establishment of Israel, must have been sort of um, solidifying and changing and, 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 and evolving during these, uh, these strange years. Peretz Arad took to art uh, quite early on as a, as a child from almost the minute she could hold a pencil she was drawing. And so it must have come as no surprise to her parents uh, when she announced at, at 16 in 1937 uh, that she wanted to, to leave home and start working in, a, in a, an artist studio. Her parents had given up a huge amount of their, their former wealth, their, their background, in moving to Tel Aviv. Palestine, as it then was, uh, was a fairly unforgiving place for, for newcomers. Uh, and uh, much of their old life had had to leave behind. Her father was a bank clerk, her mother a teacher, and they both had to change their professions. Her father became an electrician, and her mother worked as a, as a merchant. So, as you can imagine, they were fairly uh, unsure, uncertain of her, her desires to become an artist, uh, a, a fairly unstable profession. But she seems to have earned their support. Uh, and in 1937, she started working in uh, the studio of an artist called Aaron Avni. Peretz Arad obviously convinced her parents that this was going to work. Uh, and she uh, revealed to them that she'd be financing her studies by cleaning Avni's studio. Um, this must have been a, a, a remarkably uh, exciting time for, for a, so young a person to be discovering the world of art, discovering the, the, the theories and the practices behind a, a, a working artist's workshop, but also a time of real vulnerability, just 16 years old, working in a, in a, in a sort of strange new creative, uh, creative world. I think in Esther Peretz Arad's portraits of, of women in particular, you can feel something of that, that vulnerability, that empathy, that sort of compassion, and, and that sense of, of, um, of respecting the models in their space and giving them a, a sense of sort of, um, of, of, of purpose and, 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 uh, uh, and sort of restfulness. It took Peretz Arad some time to work free of the influence of, of Avni, but it was also here in this sort of studio environment that she really uh, got the grounding in, in art history, in art theory, in art practice uh, that underpins all of this sort of wonderful freedom in her, in, in her work. It was also in Avni's studio where she met a number of young artists, including Grisha Arad, who was to become her future husband. He was a young sculptor, he trained in Vienna, uh, and then he'd left the kibbutz behind uh, to embark on a, on a solo career. They married not long after meeting each other in 1943. Then in 1948, as the, the war of Israeli independence broke out, Grisha Arad was uh, wounded and spent a year convalescing in hospital. And during that time, Peretz Arad took up teaching. And this sort of opened a, a new world of, of uh, trying to communicate all those things that she'd learned, all those things that she'd um, uh, discovered in, in Avni's studio uh, to, to young children. Um, something that her mother had done before they moved uh, to Israel. And so a nice sort of continuation of a, of a, of a family, uh, family tradition there, a family theme.
You'll have noticed in this exhibition that alongside these beautiful portraits of, of women, of, of models in the studio, portraits of, of men and maybe, maybe family members too, there are some fantastic landscapes as well. The landscape of, of Israel and, and Palestine as it was before is really known for its light. It has this sort of fantastic sort of searing light that, that illuminates everything around it. And back when Chagall was working towards his, his, uh, his studies of, of the Bible and, and the, the famous Bible suite, uh, he travelled to Palestine and he thought it the most bright, the most brilliant light that he'd ever seen. It completely changed his way of thinking and you can feel that same light, that same intensity in Esther Peretz Harrod's landscapes. This sort of fantastic feeling of the colour that sears through the sky down to the landscape below it. Particularly in, a, in this sort of lovely watercolour up here, you can almost see that effect itself. This sort of beautiful light beam that sort of electrifies this little sort of rural idyll beneath it. And part of that effect comes from Peretz Harrett's uh, ability to use the freedom of paint, the freedom of, um, of, of oil paint on the brush, but also watercolour, the spilling and the staining. That sort of fantastic loss of control or, or on the cusp of control and out of control, which gives her painting so much movement, so much vitality. There's something so refreshing, I think, about seeing a female painter working with female models. It's really been the, the, the nude and the female figure has for so long been the preserve of, of male painters and, and uh, it's sort of been charged with all those associations of the male gaze and, and, uh, and male sexuality and, and predation. It's, it's really refreshing to see these very different portraits of women. And they come from a very different place of, of understanding and, and, uh, and empathy and, and, um, and sort of respect for the, 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 the vulnerability of the situation of a model sitting in front of a, of a painter and having to sort of give themselves up to, to the artist. I think this is a really lovely portrait here. It shows not just the sort of this beautiful face in this moment of, uh, of rest, but also the wonderful sense of the clothing sort of folding around the forms. And again, these beautiful spatterings of the of the ink, this sort of looseness of the way the colour's been applied and the charcoal. There's a great kind of liveliness to the way this figure's been drawn. It gets to the essence of what drawing is really about. It's about seeing what's in front of you and, and translating that moment onto the page. Not just the sort of the, the basics of, of, of silhouette and, and, uh, and form, but of getting a, that very moment, that very sort of moment of, of tension or, or frisson down on the page. Though she was a, a prize-winning artist and had shown a number of, uh, of mixed exhibitions, the real breakthrough in Esther peretz uh, career came in 1959 when she was invited to exhibit at the, uh, the Helena Rubinstein Museum in Tel Aviv. And that launched a, a nearly four decade career of, of exhibitions internationally around the world from South America to the USSR. I particularly like in this exhibition this fantastic series of four portraits along this back wall here. And they give a, a sense of the, the tremendous rhythm and, and movement that's in Esther Parrott's, uh, Parrott's work. Really all of Esther Parrott Sarad's uh, work, even in, in, in painting, uh, draws on her knowledge of, of, uh, of drawing and, and, and her skill as a draftsman. Um, the sense of line, the movement, the rhythm in all of her work, whether it's with a brush or with charcoal or a pencil, or even with, with uh, oil paint on, on, on the canvas, it feels like everything, every, every move, every, every touch on the canvas is invested with that sort of sense of, of movement and motion. I love it here on this portrait, this woman who's almost sort of hitching her, 
her skirts out like a, like a tango dancer. This beautiful motion of the cloth that's been picked up here that's sort of echoed in all these different lines. Or even in this sort of fairly static pose of this lady standing here, this sort of contrapposto pose. It's got a tremendous sense of life and, and, and vitality. You can more, almost sort of feel it happening in front of you. You can feel this drawing with this beautiful wash being applied right there in front of you. What I think I love most about Esther Peretzara's work and what you can kind of glean from you hear her, her sons, Attar and Ron, uh, talking about her, her remarkable career and her life, is that there's no fussiness to the work that she's produced. There's no um, sort of uh, muddling around with the details. There's nothing done with the teeth between the, uh, with her tongue between her teeth. Um, there's great vigor to the way she paints. If you come look at these landscapes with me over here, The paint's almost been delivered onto the paper. It's got this fantastic rhythm across it. As I said earlier, how, how drawing seems to sort of underpin everything that, that Esther Peretzara does. It's almost like she's drawing with the paint here, that every brush stroke is about building that, that sense of the landscape, that sense of movement across the valley. And which is echoed in the mountain up here and in this beautiful sky. We can see some of those colours coming through the blue, those pinks, those lilacs. All invested with that kind of that kind of brooding, almost biblical light that Chagall so loved when he came here, and which you, you can feel in, in all of Esther Peretzarad's landscapes. Going around this exhibition, it feels like everything in, in, in Peretzarad's world is, is heightened. Everything is um, a, little, a little fuller, a little brighter, a little more spectacular than our real world. You can feel that in this wonderful print, a little sort of um, moment of, of, um, of humour, this, this figure with these birds. But even in the portraits of, um, of models in her studio, of those great big landscapes, you can feel a kind of a joy and a, and a, a celebration of her subject. Uh, those models are not just models, they become great muses or goddesses of, of sort of, uh, of, of old and ancient Greek times sitting in their, in their lounges with these sort of beautiful flowing clothes. All those landscapes become great big sort of epic vistas that you can imagine um, sort of great battles or, 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 or uh, voyages uh, of old sort of taking place over them. I think that really speaks to the, the heart of what her, her art was about. It was about the sensation of being an artist, of seeing things and seeing a, a sort of a brighter and, and heightened world um, in, the, in the reality around us. That ding you've just heard actually uh, was the sound of someone just purchasing one of the pictures in this exhibition. We've got a healthy number of red dots on the wall, which is fantastic to see. So let's go and put one more on. That's landscape with trees, off to a new home. He is the very opposite of a superficial repetitious artist. She's somebody who time and again looks very hard at what's going on around her and she covers the waterfront really because she doesn't just deal with figures in interiors, although that is a very important part of her work. She's outward looking, she goes out onto the street. She's a very urban artist in one respect, but in another respect She's also incredibly attentive to the rural landscape, the huge vistas, the relationship between land and water and sky. All this inspires her. 
So I think she does have a very kind of impressively total vision of the world. And it's well worth our while to try and look at what she's doing and actually to admire her and respect her. And when she goes out into the landscape, some of her finest works, I think, are a, a celebration of the natural world. And she obviously loves looking at the extraordinary mixture of colors and of elemental things that are out there in front of her eyes. Uh, she loves the, uh, the movement almost. You can almost sort of see the landscape moving in front of her eyes in a rather uncanny way. So it's kind of ever-changing. And sometimes you have figures, little figures, who are gazing at that landscape rather in the way that she, the artist, would have gazed, I'm sure. But even here, when she's celebrating, she's joyful, full of admiration for the natural world, even here, you do get this other feeling as well, that the countryside is vulnerable. The countryside needs to be looked after. And that is very much of our time today, isn't it? Even though some of these pictures were made quite a long time ago, you look at them and you realize that they're very current in the respect and the concern they have for the continuation of something so beautiful as the natural world. I hope you've enjoyed uh, that little sort of uh, walk through this fantastic exhibition. It's a real, um, it's a real joy. It's a real affirmation for the Esther Perrett Sarad's uh, talents, the talents of her of her career, uh, to see these pictures up on these walls and to see them so popular with our customers. We've had a fantastic response uh, so far to this exhibition. It's a real shame we've not been able to have people in here so they can really see the works for themselves. But I hope today has gone some way in, in replicating that and, um, and letting you get a little bit closer to these really beautiful paintings. You might have seen recently our fantastic Esther Perrett Sarad catalogue uh, has, has arrived. Uh, beautiful works in it. If you've seen something that you like the look of in here but it's not available, uh, there are many more works that we have here at the gallery. So do take a look. And then on Monday, Mike is going to be talking to Ron Arad, uh, one of uh, Esther Perrett Sarad's sons, a renowned designer in his own right. And they're uh, going to have a conversation live uh, for you. So any questions about her work, about her life, we can hopefully get those answered for you. I uh, hope you've enjoyed today and we'll see you again on our next broadcast. educate, entertain our customers. OK, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. He's thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. There's nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery.